Welcome, everyone. Well, today I have a great guest. His name is Raul Martinez from Fieldcraft Survival, and he's going to be talking to us about CQB. He's a CQB expert, so we're going to cover the military aspect, law enforcement, and then civilian. What can you do in your everyday life to prepare yourself, and how can you use CQB to your advantage? But first things we're going to learn a little bit about what is CQB. So let's not waste any more time. Welcome to the show, Raul Martinez. Welcome, Raul. Thank you. It's, uh, it's good to be back. I, I enjoy these conversations because they're super informative and it allows people to kind of get a grasp on something that may seem out of reach, but really isn't. Um, and you, you, the, the user and, and the practitioner can become an expert in your home. So you can learn to know your whole house and know how to operate in your own house. And you now become the expert, right? So seeking out expert opinions is great, but it's also the, the end goal should be that you can maximize your own abilities, uh, especially in your house, right? We have complete control of our homes for the most part, depending. Um, but that's what we want. We want to be able to control that. So I, I think how we're going to flow this, and we, we were chatting about it earlier, is if we if we can understand how a more dynamic CQB style and close quarter battle or close quarter combat comes from military application, how it then transfers uh, back home with law enforcement and their application. And then finally, we'll, we'll get to the full spectrum, self-defense, home defense, everyday guy, everyday gal that wants to defend their home um, from any situation, be it just walking through it, coming into the house or defending from the inside out, because there's two different styles as well there. Um, everybody just thinks there's one giant way and it needs to be done this way. Well, there's 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 a lot to it. There's going in and then there's going out as well. So um, you guys understand the the difference. Yeah, that's a great point. And by the way, folks, Raul's out somewhere out there in the remote areas. I, would, <laughs> I don't know where he's at. So we're having we'll have some technical challenges here and there, but we'll hopefully we'll get through those with no problem. And Raul, you made a great point. And you know, I don't see. I don't see, I, I've never seen a time like it is now. We've had some of these protests, for instance, in Portland, where people actually went to the suburbs. And this heightens the necessity of CQB, in my opinion, at least, to be able to protect yourself in that environment. Yeah, and as I was mentioning, uh, Rule, that you know, right now with people seeing hordes of people in their neighborhoods, individuals watching whether or not their intentions are uh, um, innocuous nobody really knows because you can always have that one bad apple in the group of a hundred people that's standing outside your house um, and we'll talk about that too maybe you can give us an insight on cqb there but i want to let you take it away with cqb history yeah so and i know that it can go back to i mean to clearing castles with swords, right? So you would pull a smaller sword versus a bigger sword, depending on how small the hallways are. You can definitely go way, way back. Uh, let's keep it to like modern, I think would be would be most appropriate just because it, it'll make sense. I know there's some history buffs out there that are probably like, man, I want to know about that. Um, <laughs> but so in the military, and I'll speak from, from my experiences, uh, we spend a lot of time just doing glass house stuff or engineer tape stuff. So we would just draw out a layout of a room, start off with one style of a room, so a corner fed versus a center fed. And we would just practice one room at a time and then learning to flow from one room, learning to flow into two rooms, into hallways, the different uh, things that each one provides as far as information and angles, right? Because it's all a game of angles. For the military, it is more dynamic. It is more team-based. You're, if you're working overseas, you're working to kill or capture. So it's not really as uh, it's not as relatable to law enforcement. Yes, some of the movements are definitely relatable, and some of so, most of the applications are as well. But the mission is what really drives the tactic, right? If I know that there's bad guys in a house with guns and they want to hurt me and I'm there to hurt them or capture them or just end that situation, uh, I'm going to go in there a little more soundly. I'm going to move a little bit more smoothly and not necessarily slow, but I'm moving with this intent that I have to be able to respond to a threat very quickly. Uh, and that's more the military stuff. So I'm flowing. I'm looking. I'm with a team. I need to understand dynamics. I need to trust my guys. I need to run hundreds and hundreds of reps with the team that I'm running. Everybody needs to understand each other's role, 
And why this is important to talk about is because as it applies to the end users, the, the everyday guy like us, now that we're just home and we're doing our thing as, as good Americans, is that uh, the way it transfers is you don't have that team, right? But I want you to understand how we would work with a team because you may be able to train up your family to be a team. Just you want to just be careful with who you put in what roles based on sensitivity and their nature and behavior. So all those things to consider, but being in a team and seeing it work as a team helps you uh, understand the personality types and aggressive natures and who's running into a room versus who's slowing down and how to capture them and be like, hey, slow down and talk to each other. So in a team setting, you're rolling and trusting. So a lot of angles are being covered by a friend or somebody you train with. And this is after hours and hours of taking a blueprint idea of what you think a house looks like or taking common layouts for structures and building them on the ground with this engineer tape and practicing and practicing until it's time to go live. And then you have the opportunity with practice. So what I think a lot of people miss out on is practicing at home. Um, Draw the first big room of your house out on the ground with some tape. And be like, cool, now I don't have to bump into walls, break anything. There's nothing impeding. I'm just learning to move around, right? Um, But so back to the military thing, with all that rep, all that practice, uh, that's your job. It's your job to get better at understanding the angles, better at understanding the structures. Can I shoot through these walls? Are these walls made of uh, drywall and two by fours? Or is it complete thick mud? Is it going to stop a bullet? So even applying the fundamentals of, of, of firearm safety, uh, to me, it's not just knowing the target's foreground and background, right? To me, it's, can I shoot through this? Can it stop something on the back end? Are my guys outside? And if I shoot this guy in a corner, is it going to go through that corner? Like all these fundamental things that are kind of just looked at by people in the industry. And they're just kind of like, no, oh, these are just some rules for the range. I like to find their purpose in everything we do. And it, 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 you start to see the mindset and the application of it when you really think that way. So for me, walls, windows, all these things are important because if somebody is standing by a window and I miss, there's a potential, even if it rips through the person, it's going to go through the glass. And now we're dealing with what's outside. Right. And if it's nighttime, I don't know where my team is necessarily moving uh, little things like that. Right. Did the neighbor hear a crash uh, of, a, of a door or, or a window and he's coming to look in the window and you see, and all you see is the bad guy and you try and shoot the bad guy and it shoots through the window and hits your neighbor. Things that people don't uh, always consider. So understanding foregrounds, backgrounds, start with the way we started. And I had a lot of fun when, when I was a private and they're like, we're doing room clearing and it's just a layout on the ground. I was like, man, that's the coolest thing ever. Uh, but people nowadays, we want more fun, dynamic things, not realizing how much practice comes or how much practice is needed to really be uh, committed to being good at it. Um, so after experiencing that with a team and really spending a lot of time Uh, practicing with guys who are there for the same mission, the same job. We're looking out for each other. We're eating, sleeping, drinking, everything we're doing, we're doing together. Um, That left a very cool imprint of what I thought close quarter practice would be close quarter battle um, would be as it translates to the rest of the world. Uh, But then the military days were over, the deployments were over and then I came home. So Right. Uh, yeah. And thank for your. And then it becomes the a law too. enforcement thing, and yeah, you know, it was a pleasure. Best thing I could have done with my life. You were saying about law enforcement. How does it work into that area? How did it transfer over there? Yeah. So transferring it, and uh, I was trying to take a pause so that we can, we can fill in any random things that you you think your audience would like to hear from each position. So if you have something for me, just let me know and we'll cover it. It's how we're flowing with military law enforcement. And civilian. There's a couple so, of things I did want to, um, I know you understand your audience better. I want to get to know your audience better. Yeah. The audience is, you know, it's a wide range. We have individuals who are not very experienced who want to know about situational awareness. And then we do have a lot of law enforcement and military that are, uh, we've had a lot of individuals that are former green berets and even Navy SEALs, law enforcement, CIA, you name it. They've been on here. Um, so if we can later on, not now, but as you go through the, the your process, as you were talking about things like the differences between a right fed, center fed rooms, uh, is that going to be a difference? Um, you mentioned something that the bullet going through the window, that's fascinating because I remember James Bond years ago had a clip in the video 
where the woman has a gun on him and he's on a plane and he knows you don't, obviously don't understand weapons because that bullet's going to go right through me and right through the wall and break through the uh, the uh, the plane and cause everybody to die. So just the importance there of understanding your weapon and the damage that it can cause was a great point by you. Um, so to tell us back to the process and we'll get more to it again. So I was, I was just kind of looking at things like center fed. I know that's going to be an important part. Uh, I know in military, you have things, there's always debate between high port, low port. I don't think that's, that's probably a little too much for this conversation, <laughs> but we'll leave it with the other stuff. You know, high port and low port, it, it, it can be argued on all sorts of different fronts. And do we want to carry the muzzle point? So if, if you guys are listening and you don't know what this is, high port would be my muzzle is pointed upward and low port would be my muzzle is pointed downward. If you're the front man, if you're the first guy through, which most of the population that's defending their home will be, your barrel needs to be pointed in the direction that your eyes are tracking. So how that, how, how understanding high port and low port and how it's going to eventually transfer to CQB for the everyday uh, citizen is going to be that. Your, your barrel needs to be where your eyes are looking and it's moving with you so that if you have to shoot, it's already there. You're not having to drive the gun up or drive the gun down, right? Those high port, low ports apply more to a team setting where there's three, four people behind me and one needs to cover high if there's a staircase as soon as you walk in. So there's houses where if you walk in the front door, the staircase to the upstairs is right there. So I'm coming and I'm trying to see as much of the upstairs, but I'm also driving what's on the flat line where I am. So the first floor room and the guy behind me is going to cover me high. So that's those are the instances where high port and low port make a huge difference. Um, but the history of high port and low port is actually funny. Uh, the Army goes low port because of helicopters and the Navy goes high port because of boats. And you don't want to shoot the two things that are going to keep you alive and afloat. <laughs> so uh, in its inception, those were just carry positions that were administrative for people not to damage the vehicles that they were traveling in. Uh, that's why you see a lot of the Navy SEALs running high port. We run high port as well. I'm an advocate of high port. It's all situational. So practicing all of them and getting good at understanding where they apply, that's true knowledge. It's not just, I like this, this is what I'm doing. It's, this is applicable here, and this is applicable there, and knowing when to apply that. That's the true knowledge, that's the expert individual, and that can be anybody that's willing to take the time to understand what they're doing and why. That's great, fabulous stuff. Yeah, because you never know, you might own a boat on the marina, and you think somebody's uh, on the boat. <laughs> Low port may not be the best option. Yeah. Excellent. So <laughs> how did you apply it in your days of law enforcement? <laughs> so getting into law enforcement was, was actually pretty cool. I never thought I'd be, I'd be a cop, first of all. And in Chicago, we're called cops. Sometimes it offends people. Sometimes it doesn't. If you're a cop and you're offended by words, get a new job. <laughs> um, so and that's not just being rude. It's just being funny. Like, you have to have tough skin in that business. Uh, so. When I started, so at first I was very militant because that's all, I, that was the style that I knew. And I like to think of myself as a thinker and I was looking at situations and I was like, well, we're not really going in there to hunt a bad guy down in the same sense that we were doing it in the military. So my purpose wasn't to go in there and eliminate the threat. It was go in there and grab the guy and bring him to jail and build a case around him, put him through trials, and he goes to jail and serves his sentence. Because now we're in America, and I'm clearing houses in America with Americans. <laughs> so they all have constitutional rights. All these things that when in the military, we went overseas to defend, I'm not gonna come here and violate those rights because they're still American. Yeah, you do bad shit, you're a bad guy, whatever. You're still lucky that this country affords you those luxuries. And, and as a law enforcement officer, I respected that. I respect the constitution to this day. And it was one of those things where it's like, I'm not here to, to oppress anyone. That was our job was to free people from those things. Uh, I'm not gonna bring it home and I'll become an oppressive agent of the government. As law enforcement, we were there to help. That was my purpose. If I can help stop bad guys that were gonna hurt good people, that was the job. So translating that to CQB, it was less, um, let's go in there and just whoever stands up, bam, they're gone. Um, that's not what it was in law enforcement. I was in there and I was trying to find, you know, I was trying to find Mookie, like, hey man, where's this guy at? Where is he hiding? Let's try to snatch him up. Ideally for law enforcement, it's less a liability. They have to leave the house sometime. So I would always just watch guys. I would try to pick up patterns. I was lucky that in Chicago, 
as a cod of um, freedom to maneuver. So even as a patrol guy, you can start doing your own surveillance. You can start learning and seeing patterns in your community. You're pretty much uh, that's gridded out. So you have five, six blocks that are yours. And if the, I mean, the district is bigger and then each um, set of officers, so they have different segments of that district, right? Um, so you start to know the district, you start to know the areas you're going to be working in, you can start doing surveillance and ideally you want to hide. Um, but how the CQB portion, once you have to go inside to get them, and this is after a long process of your information is put together well, submitted to a judge, the judge needs to approve the fact that you're about to kick somebody's door down and go into them. So it's not like cops just decide to run in unless it's a forcible felony and you run into a house and I have to come in after you. That's very different than me a search warrant, me having to put it in front of my supervisors, in front of um, a judge. And the judge needs to be like, OK, all of these things document meet the qualifications for you to execute as a law enforcement officer to go into a house. So there's a little bit more, right? It's more than just actionable intel in the military, where we just hit house after house after house after house, and there were none of the houses that we were supposed to hit. It just that's the way it was. Um, or you would just clear the whole neighborhood to make sure that that the neighborhood was safe. Where in America, again, there's a process that goes into going into somebody's house. So once you're in the house, you're also not trying to damage things. You're trying to obviously, if things get damaged, it happens but you're trying to be respectful at the same time that you're there to capture somebody who doesn't necessarily want to be captured. Um, so the angles are still a thing that plays into it because I need to be able to see what I'm doing. Uh, you just flow a little bit better. You give commands. So you're yelling, Hey, Chicago police department, we're coming in, we're in the house. You announce your office, you announce your office, come out with your hands up. You're addressing it. So it's not an element of surprise and trickery the way you would do it in a dynamic setting where you're just like, boom, and everybody's going and everybody's trying to figure things out and find the place they need to be uh, as, as law enforcement. That's the, the big difference, right? The paperwork that goes into actually going into somebody's house. And then when you're in the house, you're announcing yourself, you're, you're telling them who you are so they know you're a cop. It's not just a burglar kicking a door down. Uh, you're telling me uh, to the point where I would tell people why I was in the house. Hey, we're looking for John Doe. And this is the reason why. And then if the mom was in the first, she'd be like, what? Johnny did what? He's upstairs. Go get him. You know, even people <laughs> will help you once you give them the information. <laughs> but if it's a surprise and everybody feels ambushed, it becomes like almost like a personal attack. Uh, so for me, when I would stop people, even on the street, I would tell them exactly why I was stopping them. I'd clear up any confusion. It wasn't like, oh, I'm stopping you because I wanted to. That bothers people. That would bother me. If, if I was stopped by a law enforcement officer and he just stopped me because he wanted to and wouldn't tell me why, I'd be a little bit on the, on the edge for that. I'd be like, mm, this isn't how this works. Uh, so so that's, those are the tactics that I would do. And it's important that, I'm, that we're addressing this because it's, it's going to be something that's even more important as an everyday citizen that's defending their house either from the outside or from the inside because you want to give those commands you want to give the option for these people to get so i'll paint a picture right as we transfer or trans uh yeah as we transfer over to the civilian side of cqb if i walk if i see my doors cracked at my house and i go in there sneakily quietly creeping through looking at angles making sure that this this is the, is there and the burglar's rustling through some some drawers and he can't hear that I'm in there. And I'm just like, God, a boom, boom, boom. And I shoot that guy. That's a very different situation um, that could have potentially been avoided. Either way, it's going to go to court. The tort system allows anybody and everybody to sue whoever. So there's potentials for, for lawsuits no matter what anyway. Um, but you shooting a guy in the back because you were like, oh, shit, I'm in the same room with this bad guy that just broke into my house. What do I do if he turns around? What do I? So all these things that people don't know, typically process. Right. Uh, so the announcement part and, and why it's important is if I can open the door and stay in the threshold, best case scenario, I open the door, stay in the threshold, give the commands. If there's anybody in the house, I'm the homeowner. I have a firearm. I've called 911 all these things and you hear some rustling and then something cracks and goes out the back door situation solved. Nobody's in the house. You file your reports, you do what you can to try and identify 
um, home security system and dogs are a huge deal. Uh, bad guys don't like dogs and they don't like cameras. <laughs> so <laughs> things to consider uh, on the outside. And they don't like lights in the evenings, right? So motion censored lights that go off in the yard, that stuff helps. I know a lot of people that use that as a deterrent, um, especially if they have fenced yards. Because if you have a fenced yard, no lighting, no cameras, once they're in that fenced yard, the bad guys are also secured with privacy. So things to consider if you guys live that way. Uh, Again, that command from the entry point, you control the entry point. Can you I can ask you one question. Too? You're not isolating yourself in one of the rooms in your house. Yeah, you know, one of the things, you know what, I've, I've spoken, we're going to have another guest, folks, on Thursday, by the way. Um, so you want to catch our other podcast coming up with Masada Yub. And I remember we talked about this. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Masada Yub, Ro. Okay. Yeah. One of the things he mentioned, which, which just happened yesterday, I guess that's what dawned on me, is that people have to be careful that if you think there's a burglar in the house and you call the cops to be walking around with your gun looking for that burglar, because then you might encounter a cop. And unfortunately, I think it happened a, a couple of days ago with a 92 year old woman who came out with a shotgun. And we don't know all the story yet, but I know the officers ended up firing on her because she started aiming the shotgun at, at them. And I think it was, she goes legally blind. So that means she can still see, but not very well at all. So I'm not sure what happened there, but uh, that could be a problem, right? Yeah. It's a, it, it's a huge problem. And a situation like that where a, a longer gun you would use for self-defense in the home, so a shotgun or a rifle, it's really hard to make that thing not look aggressive. Right. Because if I'm just holding it in hands like this and I turn towards you to look at you, it it almost looks like I'm pointing the gun at you because it's connected to my torso. My torso is turning in your direction. So whether she intentionally turned to, to try to identify them or not, I bet it looked like she was driving her whole body with the gun. And I'd be scared as well because I don't want to be shot by anybody. So whether that was the reason why or not, but I, in my mind, I try to paint paint it in every light possible. What were the officers saying? What would it look like if I was in the officer's shoes? What would it look like in the person who, who was holding the gun on the other end? Uh, and then try to paint it and see the scenario for more than what it is, more than what we see on camera, right? To me, cam seeing footage on camera isn't always the best indicator of a situation. There's no emotion behind it. There's no smells. You're not there physically feeling what's going on. There's tension in the air. If you've been in any sort of altercation, there's tension in the air. Like there's this energy that you feel. And those are the things we need to cue in. And sometimes video doesn't portray that. Uh, but back to that, that case, I, I totally believe that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, when you, those decisions need to be something you think about because you can't compound the decisions, right? So if, now that we're talking about home defense, if you're coming home and the door's cracked, and you can do one of two things, and this is all part of your planning and, and comfort level and how far you want to take it. You can pull away and not even address the house unless there's somebody in there, right? So let's say there's no cars in the driveway, doors cracked, and you're kind of like, mm, I didn't leave the door cracked. Or you could just be like, maybe somebody who left after me left the door cracked. So there's absolutely nothing in the house, right? So it, it can be something or it can be absolutely nothing. And do we take that chance? Do we call law enforcement, let them handle that? Uh, best case scenario, nobody's there. They take a report. They let you know that nobody's there. And that's what we would do. Um, cleared house for John Smith. There's nobody in the house. False alarm. You code it out as there being nothing. End of the day, it actually looks productive on law enforcement side. And it, it draws attention to the potential. Like, let's say somebody did crack the door open, get scared, and then they're hiding in the bushes. Now they see law enforcement come and sweep the house. They're like, well, shit, these people call the cops. I'm not going back there. Uh, so, right. It's like seeing things from here and then seeing things from 30 feet in the air. Uh, and, and that's what I'm saying. Like I strategize in my mind or I try to see how it, every decision will impact into the future, uh, not just right here, right now. So you can make the decision to call and have professionals do it. If you're not comfortable doing it, if you wanted to do it yourself, you go into the house. If you want to combine the two, just remember that information gets lost when you call dispatch. Dispatch will listen to everything you're saying, but they're not always going to write it down or they're not always going to send that information to the officers. So they might say, you might tell them, I'm wearing a blue shirt, I'm going into my house, and they're over here writing what they need to be writing. All they heard is blue shirt and they write bad guy in blue shirt. 
but it's actually the good guy in the blue shirt. And that's happened a bunch of times where you try to address yourself, but if you're giving your details, they're going to be looking for you. They're not going to be looking for the bad guy, right? So you need to tell them your actions. I'm going to be in the house. They're probably going to say, don't go in the house, which is typical uh, and let them do their job. So would I enter my own house? I probably would. Um, if there was somebody in the house, like the kids, and I knew the kids were home and the doors were cracked, I would just again, to, to be safe. And then chances are for the most part, it's going to be nothing. Uh, but it, in the worst case scenario, you do want to prepare and train. So going through your house, understanding the angles, um, giving commands, even as of the homeowner, right? I'm the homeowner of the house, blah, blah, blah. You're talking, you'll see your little kid pop his head off. You're like, dad, I came home early. And then you're like, well, well, that's all that riddle. <laughs> and you're not even worried about, uh, bad guys being in the house or, you know, your, your, your kid invites a friend over and your friend just happens to be that kid that doesn't close the door behind them. Right. So all these scenarios that can be presented. So even knowing and being comfortable with your equipment and your gun and not running around with fingers on triggers and you get startled and the gun goes off, uh, all those decisions that need to be made. So there's a, an idea that muzzle being pointed away and finger out of the trigger are the safest bets. If your finger's off the trigger, and this happens all the time in law enforcement, guys just pointing muzzles at each other, but nobody's getting shot. Yes, it's rude. Yes, it's something that's ill practice. It's an ill practice, but it happens very often. And I'm not advocating for it in any way, but just know that if you happen to muzzle somebody, it's, it's not the best practice. But as long as you're not fingering the trigger, getting scared and launching rounds, uh, the gun's not going to go off by itself, right? So things to consider, but getting into the practice of it, how I would suggest practicing for the everyday person, uh, there's two ways, two very important ways. Most stuff will happen either when you're gone, unless you're a target for something specific. And then that tells me that you're special. And, and I tell this to people all the time. What if somebody attacks me like this? I'm like, well, how special are you that an assassin wants to come and get you? Um, so don't, don't live in that realm where, where you're thinking, you know, <laughs> three assassins with shurikens are going to come in and like they're masked out, like relax. It's, it's not how it works. It's usually a crime of opportunity. They don't want to encounter you. <laughs> they want something to go sell it, to go feed, feed a, 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 some sort of addiction. So uh, for the most part, they're not in there to, to capture you or try to kidnap anybody. It's, it's not the, the bulk of the situation. Is it possible? Sure. Uh, if you live a certain lifestyle, things to consider, right? Get a consultant, learn those things as they apply to the nature of the level of security that you might need. Uh, for everyday folks, there's two major ones, right? I would suggest training from your bedroom out. So if it happens and it happens at night, maybe you put the car in the garage and you usually put it outside. And so somebody's looking at your house. The next day they look at your house, the car's inside. They think nobody's home, right? Um, so these are separate charges too. If you want to look at how the law works, One's home invasion and one's just burglary. If nobody's home, it's just a burglary. They came to get property. You have insurance. It's, they're a little more lenient on the offenders. But if you're in the house, it now becomes a home invasion because a life is at risk. It's at risk from law enforcement and it's a risk from the bad guy. Um, so a lot of things can happen in, in you know, crime or uh, fruit of the tree. It can be fruit of the poison tree can be, I'm a cop. I come in to shoot the bad guy. The bad guy ducks. I shoot the homeowner. Well, it's the bad guy's fault. It's not the cop's fault, right? Because I would never be there if the bad guy wasn't there. So there's all these trickling effects that people sometimes don't know, or maybe they just don't care. But know that as law enforcement responders, they're tasked with a huge set of rules that they have to make instant decisions and hope that everything pans out properly. So don't be so hard on, uh, on our cops if you're out there and you're super judgmental of law enforcement. Um, so training your way out of certain rooms. So start with the bedroom. It's the most likely room you'll be in when you hear a noise and you've already all probably have done this. You heard a noise in the house, you're in the bedroom. All right, let's go. And you go and start looking through the house, right? So it can be as, as mundane as, uh, let me go see the, the dishwasher turned down and it made a weird rattle and it was set to turn on at 9 PM, right? And you're already in bed. So clearing the angles, slowing down, gathering as much information of the room as possible with your eyes, because the eyes feed us information, right? So I'll look through a room. I'll try and see what I can see. I'll move to an angle. I'll see more. I'll move to the other angle. I'll see as much as I can. I'll do a quick peek just to see what's there. And then I'll continue on through the room. So it, it happens quickly. Just try to pick up as much information as possible. Rooms are generally pretty big and there's furniture. So there might be 
uh, stuff behind the furniture. But as you close that distance, you can look again, the chances of somebody hiding under something or doing something else, they're either in there to grab something, which requires them to be in an upright posture to carry. You're not going to be carrying or dragging it on the ground, trying to hide behind stuff and carry your TV. Right. Um, so think of the mechanics of the body as if I was trying to carry something of value, uh, forks and knives. Yeah, they can grab those, but are they silver? Or, you know what I mean? Like you can paint any scenario you want and just be, be completely out of whack with it. Realistically, they're going for a TV, a computer, something big that they can move and transport, but they need their legs for that. So they're going to be upright. You're going to be able to see them. Um, so think of it like I try, I try to be as informative as possible with that because realistically that's what's going to happen that's what we've seen I've drove driven up to scenes and I've seen a guy walking out of a house with a tv I'm like man he doesn't look like he lives there <laughs> right and, and so it's an upright thing it, it, you're going to see them walking and moving so taking angles learn just looking and seeing you know using the door frames the door frames are very important they're struck they're soundly supported uh, it's a load bearing area so there's more material there corners doorways as much as they tell people fatal funnel this fatal funnel that look the reinforcements on both sides it's a ton of material chances are that that'll stop around before the center of the wall will stop around which is uh space two by fours with plywood where on the door frames it's stacked pieces of wood to create the reinforcement right so working along the door frames is important. So just seeing the angles and you'll start to see the room present itself, remember what's there and then flow to the area that you couldn't see from inside of the room that you were in. So then you go into your hallway, see what other areas are there. If you know that your son sleeps with the door cracked and a nightlight on, and that looks exactly like it always looks, bypass that room, right? Because it's the same. But now if the door's shut, and there's no light peering out of the bottom because it's dark. Those are the things to consider, right? So actually not just being like, no, I'm home, I don't care about anything. Uh, reading the behavior of the people in the house is very important, knowing people's habits in your house. And it's not creepy or weird, right? But people just whatever. Um, it's like I already know if the door's cracked on, on my little girl's room, then she's either doing something or something happening, but she sleeps with the door cracked. Because the dog likes to sleep in the room and the dog needs to move its nose and open the door and get out in the middle of the night. So early in that evening, the, the door is partially cracked and then the door is open when the dog gets out. And I know that's usually 11, 12 o'clock. So little things like that, that that's important to know. Um, do people have the habit of closing the bathroom door, leaving it open? Is there a nightlight or a trail light? Uh, all these things that are going to be super situational and independent to each one of the homeowners that's listening to this, that's, that's considering practicing this, um, the more information we have, the better decisions we can make. So again, uh, the basic mechanics and movements, we're going to be going through doors. We're going to be looking at the angles, trying to see as much of the room as possible. If it looks like what I'm used to seeing, flow into the room, continue to walk. And it's again, it's walking and seeing walking and seeing and you're looking you're picking up information making decisions based on what's in the room uh and then going down uh if you have to go downstairs it's just going downstairs on an angle where your back's to the wall and you can start to see the room and it's all about angles like that's the best thing and you can see it if you look into any doorway parts of that room are not visible to you but if i just lean my head a little forward or a little backwards i start to see things uh, as far as the way the room present it, presents itself. So do that practice, be in the doorway. And I know the whole fatal funnel thing, um, but if you're flowing from one side of the doorway to the other, you're using protection on that side. And as you get to the other side, you're now being protected by the other side. So it's just that moment in time where you can pan across, see the visual of the room and then move into that room and then the next room and then the next room and you have a house. You can practice this any time of the day. And if you want to show your family and get them the same practice, draw it on the ground and draw it life size in your yard with some tape and go out there and show them how to flow and see angles. Uh, on top of the, the visual, being able to see what you want to see and address what's, what needs to be addressed, how you move your body as well. Oh, that's a big one, right? So you want to be able to position yourself to the max advantage of the full use of your body. So you'll see people kind of like angle up to a door and try to do a peek. And I've now exposed a little bit and I'm looking, but my body's comp I'm not strong. I can't address. I don't have two hands forward or two feet forward. Uh, if I address it fully with hands 
in an available position. If something comes through the door, I can push, I can pull, my hands are available. So always in a strong position, always athletic in nature, um, ready to counter anything that, that, that might present itself. A lot of great stuff. And I know, Raul, you'll agree with this. You only touched the tip of the iceberg. And if I remember correctly, you did a video on CQB right <laughs> on YouTube. I did, and it's it's being pieced together. So I've released little chunks here and there just to get people into it. Uh, and it, it talks about this, basically. It's, it's talking about how to use your, your body, how to position yourself behind the gun. Uh, it's still in the works before we release the full episode of, of that video, but it, it's just that. It's, it's basic movement and understanding of angles. It's nothing crazy. It's no dynamic stuff. Uh, we all live a different life now. I'm out on the road teaching a lot more and the purpose of education. And even where I live, uh, I try to practice it. And I know it's a pretty safe neighborhood and my house is secure, but I do it in practice just because if we're trying to educate, we need to stay up to speed on those things. And that video covers that, the basics of movement, understanding and angle, where to position yourself, how to better maximize your ability to see before you enter. Uh, and, and though it seems like a, a basic video, it's intro to, quarter movements and it, it really sounds like most people are like oh i'd rather go in a shoot house and do this just knowing how to flow what to look for what to what to actually expect from your body uh as it's dumped with adrenaline and all you're doing is the same thing only you're doing it with adrenaline and maybe a firearm so those are the little things that, that are in that video and it's an intro video it's going to be I, I i personally thought it was great and i was like man i was able to dump all this information that i had and it was I think the video total is like 30 minutes of basic movement and understanding to give you comfort and that baseline where you're actually excited to start practicing. Yeah, much more involved than people think. And you can find that. That's a Fieldcraft Survival. It will be. It will be on the Fieldcraft Survival YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, I put little bits of videos in, in on my Instagram page, Raul.Martinez.Junior, and also on the main Instagram page for Fieldcraft Survival. So if people are looking for that kind of stuff, we put out so much free content because we believe in the education. And I know that there's a, an industry thing where people are like, don't put out content because then people won't go to classes. We have found that the more information we put out, the more excited people become to take physical training. So again, as, as, as a company that's designed and, and is pro training people and equipping people and making them as prepared as possible, we're preparing you with visual information, audible information on our podcast. We're giving you training tips. We're giving you stuff people do in classes, even some of the drills we do. Um, it's one thing to hear a drill and then you do it. And then it's another drill to come. It's another thing to come and do that same drill with me watching you and giving you feedback that's actually going to change you as a shooter. So for us, we don't see competition in other companies. We don't see anything as a detriment to our business. We're simply just trying to make people better. And we know that that vibe goes out and people show up no matter what. We have sold out classes all over the country, which is very humbling and very exciting. Oh, I completely agree. I completely agree with you. It's, it's like people who give all the moves away in jujitsu videos and stuff like that. There's a difference between watching a video and actually doing it <laughs> with an instructor. It just is night and day. And there's just so many little nuances, as you mentioned, too. There's just so many nuances that just get missed. Even with our show today, shoot, 30 minutes already. We're in. We're done. Um, folks, by the way, again, Fieldcraft Survival, Raul.Martinez.Junior on Instagram. Definitely give him a follow on Instagram. You'll see a lot of good stuff there. Uh, the next episode, as I mentioned, Masada Yub is going to be talking about the Castle Doctrine and the True Man Doctrine. So he's going to look at the legal aspects of some of these issues with home invasions and robberies. Uh, so we're going to cover today. We covered great stuff with Raul. And hopefully we can bring it back again to cover more stuff of this nature and to get more into it. And he's always got something up his sleeve. He's always got something he's training on. Uh, it's great stuff. I mean, he's got great things. <laughs> I think he even did a video, and we'll talk about it next time if we can, uh, defense in your car. I think I remember seeing that, how to use your car for cover, or how to protect yourself in the car. That was great stuff. Yeah, lots of stuff. And like I said, we're sharing it with people because we believe in the message of getting everybody prepared. And it's not always about money. Training is expensive. And I think people miss out on uh, on training because they think it's expensive. I mean, you're, you're investing in yourself. What better investment could you possibly be making? <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks again, Rolf. If you wouldn't mind, tell uh, Mr. Ayub I said hello. <laughs> 
Oh no, not at all. I will definitely. <laughs> he's a he's a he's a nice, really nice guy. Well, you know that he's a super nice guy, super knowledgeable. He's been around for. Well, I won't yeah. say it very much. He's been around for decades. I don't I don't want to be rude, but he's been around for a very long time. Raul, thank you so much for being here. We truly appreciate your time. <laughs> thank you. It was a pleasure being on. I love talking about these things and educating everybody. So if you guys ever need anything from me, feel free to reach out. Um, Again, if you want to do more with me, let me know. And we'll keep talking. We'll keep educating. Absolutely. Maybe we'll get you in a panel with Masada. You. That'd be kind of fun. I'm all about it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Make sure to share and subscribe to support our podcast. Thanks, everyone.